Great. So good day, and thank you very much for inviting me to come here. So my name is Johan, and I'm working in Strasbourg at the IGBMC, so that is that place here. And if you have a look at that picture, then you might have the feeling that our institute is in the middle of nowhere. And actually, this is not completely wrong. So we are south of Strasbourg, and Strasbourg is in France, and it's right on the border with Germany. That's the Rhine River. Here is Strasbourg, and there is Germany. So there's just, you just have to cross a bridge, and then you are in Germany, which can be very convenient if you want to buy some sauerkraut or some beer or so, what we usually do. And if you've never been to, uh, to Strasbourg, then I strongly encourage you to come. So this is, for example, here our cathedral that is this year celebrating its thousandth anniversary. And that has been the tallest building in the world for over 200 years. And we also host the European Parliament because indeed there is a European capital that is Strasbourg. And we have a European Parliament. I'm in Strasbourg now since seven years. I have no idea what they are doing. <laughs> but I'm very, we are very proud of having it and paying for it. <laughs> and so um, the IGBMC, where I'm working, is one of the major um, centers for biomedical research in, in Europe, or it's one of the biggest ones. So we have 47 research teams working on cancer, on Alzheimer, on Huntington disease, on muscle disorders. So we're in four departments. That is my department here. That's the translation of medicine department. We also have what we call the platforms. That's very, um, very um, good thing, the platforms, because these are people with a high technical knowledge that help us for any kind of experiment. And we are also hosting the ICS that is producing mouse models for any kind of disease for uh, any labs in the world. So it's a, a pretty exciting place, although it's a bit far away from Strasbourg. So um, in our team, we are working on congenital myopathies. So just to give you a very brief overview, so congenital myopathies affect adults and children in all populations and always represent a significant burden for the patients and for the families. Um, and so most of these congenital myopathies are associated with progressive muscle weakness and the associated problems. That is breathing because the diaphragm is also muscle. And there are 10 to 15 different congenital myopathies that can be distinguished by the structural anomalies on biopsies. That's why we need the biopsies for the patients. So we take the biopsies from the patients, then we make the sections, and then we do some chemical staining that is called histology. And depending on what we see, we can distinguish between the different congenital myopathies. For example, if you have something like this, where you have this staining that is called Gomori staining, you have this strange red aggregates here, then this is called tubular aggregate myopathy. If you have on another staining, these um, central areas where there seem to be no staining, then here the best bet would be central core disease. And if you have a picture like this that you all know very well where the nuclei are in the center, where there should not be, then this is referred to as central nuclear myopathy. And we know now that there are several genes that are associated with central nuclear myopathy, but we can distinguish the different genes also on the histology. So what we typically see in patients with mutations in MTM1, so in my tubular myopathy, is what we call the so-called necklace fiber. So these, uh, that is your muscle fiber. And you see here this peripheral dense area. So this is something that is pretty typical for patients with mutations in MTM1. What we see, for example, in patients with mutations in BIN1 is the nuclear centralization, but also kind of clustering. So we see lots of different nuclei that are clustering in the middle of the muscle fiber, very typical for BIN1 cases. And what is very typical for dynamine 2 cases is what we call the spoke of wheel appearance of the fiber. So these fibers look a bit like spoke of wheels. So that is very typical for dynamine 2. So different genes, and I'm not sorting all of them, but we can see that they somehow have a very specific histology. So in our team, we are addressing all aspects of central nuclear myopathy. So we are in contact with patients from all over the world. We're doing the molecular diagnosis. That means that we try to find the gene that is associated with the disease. Um, then we try to understand the disease by generating animal models that is very useful to really understand how the disease develops, what are the different steps of the development. And once that we understand the disease, we are developing therapeutic approaches that one day, of course, can come back to the patients one day. So I have two, two, two talks today, lots of work for me. Um, so the first one will be about the molecular diagnosis and the second one a bit later about the approaches. And so molecular diagnosis means that we try to find the gene. So basically we are reading the DNA to find the gene. So because DNA is, if you want, it's just like a book, a pretty big book, but it's like a book. And if you consider that DNA is like a book, we could say that a chapter corresponds to a chromosome. 
And within a chapter, you have sentences, and that would correspond to a gene. And within a sentence, you have some words, which at the DNA level is called a codon. And a codon is consisted is uh, consists of four letters, C, G, A, T. Okay, so DNA is like a book, but it's a pretty big book. So this is here, for example, a very good example of a pretty big book. So who has read The Pillars of the Earth? You. Have you any idea how many characters are in that book? No idea. Okay, um, it was a very long flight. I had nothing to do on the very long flight from Strasbourg to Chicago, so I took this book and I was counting the characters from the first page to the last page. And I found out that such a book has one billion letters, one million characters, which is really a lot. But if you compare this to the DNA, then DNA, DNA has six billion characters. So this is as much as 6,000 Ken Follett books. Yeah, it's a pretty big library. And in, and in one of these books, on one of these pages, in one of these chapters, in one of these sentences, in one of these words, there is a spelling mistake. And that is what a mutation is. It's somewhere in this huge library, one spelling mistake that is responsible for the disease. And this is the one that we try to find. So how can we find the spelling mistake? So what helps a lot is have a look at the family. So that is here a very good example of a family where we see that we have here this, um, this um, filled ones, so these are the squares, so he is affected and his grandson is affected. And so that is a very typical um, example of an X-linked disorder because only men are affected and women are not. So it seems somehow to jump over generation, it doesn't really exist genetically. So what happens here is that the grandfather is affected because he has a mutation on the X chromosome. That's why he's affected, because he has only one X chromosome. Now he's giving this X chromosome to his daughter, but Marge is healthy, because she's lucky. As a girl, she has two X chromosomes. So the healthy X chromosome can compensate for the sick one. That's why she's a healthy carrier. Now she's giving that X chromosome to Bart, and he is affected. So now it's pretty important for the daughters to know that they have a 50% chance to get this red X chromosome, that means to be carriers. That's pretty important for them if they want to have children one day. For us, it's very important to see that this disease, in this case, it's clearly X-linked. So we do not need to read the whole library. We just need to read a few books, that is the X chromosome, uh, to identify the genetic cause of the disease. So our lab exists since 15 years. We're pretty successful. We analyze approximately 700 patients with central nuclear or myotubular myopathy. We found 400 cases with MTM1 mutations, 100 in dynamin 2, 10 in bin 1, 10 in titin, and 20 in the rhinidine receptor. But if you do now the additions um, and you add all these numbers, you will find out that this doesn't really make 700. Indeed, there are still 160 patients with myotubular or central nuclear myopathy that do not carry mutations in those genes, which means that there are other genes that need to be discovered. Knowing the gene is extremely important for several reasons. It's extremely important, for example, to provide the patients appropriate genetic counseling or to provide them a prenatal diagnosis for a second child, for example, or also to provide them a prognosis, prognosis for disease development. And most importantly, if you do not know the gene, then you do not have a target to develop therapies. And that's why our aim is that every patient with a central nuclear and myotubular myopathy gets a molecular diagnosis. So how do we read now really the DNA? So they are old and new methods. That is here the technique that was, used, that was used for 25 years that is called Sanger sequencing. So that was at that, at that time when it, when it came out, it was really a top design. And that is the machine that is able to read DNA, but it does it very slowly. So really letter by letter, word by word, sentence by sentence. So it was taking years to give the patients a molecular diagnosis. And it's also pretty expensive because it cost $1,000 a gene, which is okay if you have to read just one gene, but if you have to read 10, 20, 100, 200 genes, it becomes very quickly very expensive. Now since a couple of years, there was a real revolution in human genetics, a new method coming out that is called next generation sequencing and that is able to read all 20,000 genes of the human genome in one. And this costs in total $1,000, so that is much, more expensive, much less expensive and much quicker. That's why I can say that what took years before takes only weeks now to give the patients a molecular diagnosis. However, if you have a new technology, you always have new challenges. And this was here the first publication that came out using that new machine, so they were reading the DNA of 
of uh, James Watson, who was a Nobel Prize laureate, who is now over 90 and got the Nobel Prize some 50 years ago. And they found out that this guy has thousands of mutations, which is a lot for somebody who got the Nobel Prize some 50 years ago. And he's over 90, but still healthy. Now, by reading the DNAs of, our pa of other patients or other individuals, we found out that all of us, we all carry approximately 100,000 spelling mistakes in our DNA. All of us. But these are, of course, not mutations. So what we have, the 100,000 spelling mistakes, is what we call a polymorphism. And a polymorphism is not really associated with the disease. A polymorphism is just making the difference between all of us. So why do I have this hair color? Why do I have this very big nose? That is the polymorphism that is saying this. So this just making the difference between us. And patients with myotubular centrinuclear myopathy have 100,000 spelling mistakes, and 99,999 are polymorphisms, and one is imitation. And that is extremely challenging to find out which one of these spelling mistakes is really the mutation that is causing the disease. And to find out which the mutation, which one the mutation is, we are collaborating a lot with bioinformaticians that are helping us to handle these very late, large data sets that we generate and also to filter the variations. So I don't have the time to go into detail how we do this, but there are different steps. Or at the IGBMC, we have developed a pipeline that is analyzing the DNA of the patients in a very efficient way so that we hope that we can give to all patients um, a molecular diagnosis, which I remind you is the first step to develop a therapeutic approach. So this is here, for example, an overview of our results. So we have now analyzed with this new method 676 patients with congenital myopathies, not only central nuclear myotubular myopathy. In total, we have analyzed over 1,000 individuals because most of the time we also try to analyze the parents at the same time because it helps a lot to compare the DNA of the parents with the DNA of the children to find out which one is the mutation. Most of the samples are still uh, under analysis. We found also some mutations in known genes, for example, in titine or the rhinodine receptor. But in a couple of patients, we also found some new genes. So we are pretty sure that we identified new genes. So to sum up what I've shown you now in this talk is that my tubular and central nuclear myopathy always have a genetic cause that knowing the mutation that is causing my tubular central nuclear myopathy is the most important step, and the first and most important step to develop a therapy. We have now a method, a new machine, that is able to read the DNA in a very quick way, but it's very challenging because all of us carry 100,000 spelling mistakes. But we have developed also a pipeline that is also filtering the data to find out which one is causing the disease. When, if we identify a mutation, a known gene, then it's very quick that we can directly give to the patients the molecular diagnosis. If we identify a new gene, then it takes much more time, because if we identify a new gene, we must be very, very, very sure about it, and we need to do lots of experiments in the lab to prove that that mutation is really causing the disease, and in most cases, we have to generate also animal models. That's why, if it's a new gene, it takes much longer, in several years, until the patients have the molecular diagnosis. But our aim is really that every patient gets molecular diagnosis for central nuclear myotubular myopathy. So that is here our team, and I just highlighted those people that are um, implicated in the, in the genetic testing, so I'm heading this subgroup of our team, and this is just um, our bioinformatician, uh, Christella, our medical uh, PhD, uh, Vanessa and me, so thank you very much.